Chapter 43 The next morning Alec was allowed to visit Volger. As his guard let him into the Wild Count's stateroom, Alec noticed that the door wasn't locked. Alec himself had been treated politely the night before, more like a guest than a prisoner. Perhaps the tension between his men and their Darwinist captors had thawed a little in the last month. Count Volger looked comfortable enough. He was at his desk, eating a breakfast of soft-boiled eggs and toast, and didn't bother to stand when Alec arrived. He simply nodded and said, Prince Alexander. Alec bowed. Count? Volger went back to scraping butter onto a piece of toast. Standing there waiting, Alec felt like a schoolboy called in for punishment. He had never been to school, of course, but somehow adults, whether tutors, parents, or grandmotherly revolutionaries like Nini, all wore their disappointment in the same way. Surely headmasters weren't so different. Finally, Alec sighed and said, It might save time if I began. As you wish. You want to tell me that I'm a fool for having been captured again, that it was mad to involve myself in Ottoman politics. By now I could be safely hidden in the wilds. Count Volger nodded. Yes, there is that. The man went back to scraping his piece of toast, seemingly intent on covering every square millimeter with butter. In not taking your advice, I risked my life and the life of my men. Alec continued. Dr. Busk says that Klopp is recovering well enough, but I led him and Bauer into an all-out battle. Things could have turned out worse. Much worse, Volger said, then fell silent again. Let's see. Ah, I've also thrown away everything my father left me. The castle, all your plans, and finally his gold. Alec reached inside his piloting coat and felt for a hard lump sewed into the corner of the lining. He tore the fabric, pulled out what remained of the gold, and tossed it on the table. After a month of buying spices and mechanical parts, the bar had been mostly shaved away. All that was left was the round Habsburg crest stamped at its center, like a thick, roughly made coin. Volger blinked and Alec let himself smile. At least he'd finally provoked a reaction. Did you finance this revolution entirely on your own? Only the finishing touches. A little spice on top. Alec shrugged. Revolutions are expensive, it seems. I wouldn't know. I avoid them on principle. Of course, Alec said. That's what you're really angry about, isn't it? that I overturned the natural order and deposed a fellow royal, that I forgot that revolutionaries want to overthrow all aristocrats, including me and you. Volger took a bite of his toast and chewed thoughtfully, then poured himself more coffee. There is that too, I suppose, but there's one thing you've forgotten. Alec wondered for a moment what his final failure might be but then gave up. He took a cup from the windowsill, filled it with coffee, and sat down across the desk from Volker. Enlighten me. You also saved my life. Alec frowned. I did what? If you had disappeared into the wilds as you were meant to, that Tesla cannon would have sent me and Hoffman to the bottom of the sea, along with the rest of this ship's crew. The Count stared into his coffee cup. I owe you my life. Quite an annoying turn of events. Alec hid his surprise by taking a sip of coffee. It was true. Count Volger had been saved along with the Leviathan. But was the man really thanking him for joining the committee's revolution? This doesn't mean that you are any less of an idiot, of course, Volger added. Of course not, Alec said, a bit relieved. And there is also the matter of your newfound celebrity. Volger opened a drawer, pulled out a newspaper, and dropped it onto the desk. Alec picked it up. It was in English, 
New York World read the masthead. And there on the first page was a photograph of Alec above a long article by Istanbul Bureau Chief Eddie Malone. Alec let the newspaper fall back onto the table. He'd never seen a photograph of himself before, and the effect was distinctly disagreeable, like looking into a frozen mirror. Are my ears really that large? Almost. What on earth were you thinking? Alec lifted his cup, staring at the glimmering black reflection on the coffee surface. He had steeled himself to face any amount of scorn from Vulgar, but not for this. As the newspaper's name declared, the whole world was gawking at him now. His family secrets were out there for anyone to read. That reporter, Malone, he knew too much about the committee's plans. An interview was the only way to distract him. Alec dared another glance at the photo and noticed the caption, The Missing Heir. So that's why the crew have been so polite to me. They know who I am now. Not just the crew, Alec. Britain has a consulate in New York, of course. Even their bumbling diplomats could hardly have missed this. Lord Churchill himself sent that newspaper to Captain Hobbs, carried by some sort of beastly eagle. But how in blazes did you get it? Dr. Barlow and I have been sharing information for some time now. The Wild Count leaned back in his chair. She is proving to be a most interesting woman. Alec stared at the man, a slight shudder passing through him. Don't worry, Alec. I haven't told her all of my secrets. How is your friend Dylan, by the way? Dylan? He's... quite astounding at times. Alec sighed. In a way, it's because of him that I let myself be captured again. Vulgar's coffee cup froze halfway to his lips. What do you mean by that? Dylan convinced me it was safer to give myself up than to escape. There were a dozen Ottoman walkers headed toward us, I suppose. But it was more than that. He seems to think that I belong on this ship. Alex sighed. Not that it matters. Once we're back in Britain, they'll put me in a cage. I wouldn't worry about that just yet. The Wild Count glanced at the windows. Haven't you noticed? Alec looked out the window. Last night, when he'd grown too tired to stay awake, the airship had been headed back down the strait, guiding the behemoth back toward the Mediterranean Sea. But now, there were mountains passing by, tipped with orange from the rising sun. Their long shadows stretched through the mist, trailing toward his left. Are we headed east? Volger clucked his tongue. That took you some time. I'm sure your friend Dylan would have noticed right away. No doubt. But why are we headed for Asia? The war's back in Europe. When this war began, the German Navy had ships in every ocean. The Goben and the Breslau aren't the only ones that the British have been searching for. Do you know where in Asia we're going? Alas, Dr. Barlow hasn't been forthcoming on the matter. But I suspect we will be in Tokyo sooner or later. Japan declared war against Germany four weeks ago. Of course. Alex stared out at the mountains passing by. The Japanese had been Darwinists since signing a cooperation pact with the British in 1902. But it was astounding to think that the war ignited by his parents' death had already outgrown Europe and now encompassed the entire globe. This detour is inconvenient, but it keeps you out of that cage a little longer, Vulgar said. Austria-Hungary is not faring well against the great fighting bears of Russia. The time for you to reveal yourself may be sooner than I thought. He prodded the newspaper as if it were a dead fish. That is, to reveal what little you haven't already. Alec pulled the scroll case from his pocket. You mean this? I was afraid to ask if you still had it. As if I would have lost it, Alec said angrily, then realized that he had, in fact, 
lost it once already. But since the taxi incident, he'd kept the letter with him at all times. The night before, the airman who'd searched him in the cargo bay had found the scroll case and opened it. But the letter's ornate Latin script had meant nothing to him, and he had politely returned it. I'm not a complete fool, Volker. In fact, this letter is why I ignored your advice and stayed in Istanbul. What do you mean, your highness? A pointless feud among my family started this war, so it's up to me to stop it. He held up the case. This is the will of heaven, which tells me what I'm meant to do. Not skulk in hiding, but take my rightful place and put an end to this war. Volger stared at him for a long moment, then steepled his fingers. That letter is no guarantee that you'll take the throne. I know all that, but the Pope's word must count for something. Ah, uh, I had forgotten. The Wild Count turned away. You've been in a land of heathens and heretics. You haven't heard the news from the Vatican. News? The Holy Father is dead. Alex stared at the man. They say the war was hard on him. Vulgar continued. He wanted peace too much. Of course, what he wanted doesn't matter now. But this letter represents the will of heaven. The Vatican will still confirm that it's real, won't they? One would think so. Of course, someone there told the Germans about your father's visit. The man spread his hands. We must hope that this someone doesn't have the new Pope's ear. Alec turned to stare out the window, trying to make sense of Vulgar's news. After his parents' death, the whole world had gone mad, as if his family tragedy had broken history itself. But in Istanbul, somehow, things had started to fall back into place. The committee's revolution, Dylan arriving with the behemoth in his wake, all of it revealed that it was up to Alec to stop the war, to put matters right. For the first time in his life, he had felt a certainty in all his actions, as if providence were guiding him. But now the world was turning upside down again. Fate was taking him not back toward the center of the war, but away from his homeland and his people, away from everything he had been born to do. And the letter in his hand, the only thing his father had left him that Alec hadn't thrown away, might now be worthless. What mad providence was this? Afterward. Behemoth is a novel of alternate history, so most of its characters, creatures, and machines are of my own invention. But the historical locations and events are modeled closely on the realities of World War I. Here's a quick review of what's true and what's fictional. The Sultan Osman I was a real warship purchased by the Ottoman Empire and awaiting completion at a British shipyard in late 1914. As the war began, however, First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, decided to seize the ship, worried that the Ottomans might join the Germans and use the warship against Britain. The Ottomans did ultimately enter the war, but partly because Churchill had stolen their ship. It is still debated whether they would have become involved without this provocation. As in Behemoth, the Ottoman Empire was unstable in 1914. In the real world, in fact, the Sultan and his Grand Vizier were no longer in charge. They had been overthrown during the Revolution of 1908, and the Committee of Union and Progress was already in power. In the world of Behemoth, however, the 1908 revolution was unsuccessful, leaving the Sultan in power and the CUP split into many factions. I created a second rebellion in 1914 because I wanted my characters to be involved in a successful revolution, one that would perhaps nudge history toward a more positive outcome. The German influence in Istanbul was very real. They owned a popular newspaper, 
while the British Embassy had no one on their staff who could read Turkish. Hard to believe, but true. Just as in this book, the German ironclads Breslau and Gobin found themselves trapped in the Mediterranean at the beginning of the war. They escaped to Istanbul and became part of the Ottoman navy, crews and all. In return for the two ships, the Ottomans put Admiral William Sushan, commander of the Gobin, in charge of their entire fleet. On October 29, 1914, Admiral Sushan attacked the Russian navy without official permission, dragging the Ottomans into the war. In the real world, the war resulted in the end of the Ottoman Empire, which was partitioned into a number of countries, including Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. I wanted to create a history in which the empire remained intact and Istanbul retained its cosmopolitan nature as a model for the rest of the world. And yes, you really should call it Istanbul, not Constantinople, although the Ottoman aristocracy used the name Constantinie for many centuries, and many Westerners cling to the name in story and song, Istanbul was a more common name among its people. Actually, most of them just call it the city. In any case, the Turkish post office stopped delivering mail marked Constantinople in 1923. The Orient Express was a real train, of course, running along various routes from Paris to Istanbul since 1883. In its heyday, the express symbolized all that was elegant and adventurous about travel. On December 14th, 2009, a few weeks after I finished this book, it ran for the last time. There is no such thing as a Tesla cannon, but Nikola Tesla was a real inventor, famous for discovering the basic principles of radio, radar, and the alternating current. He spent decades working on a so-called death ray, and in the 1930s, he claimed it could shoot down 10,000 planes at a range of 250 miles. He offered the device to several governments, but no one took him up on it. Maybe that's a good thing.